You know, infectious diseases in low resource settings, that is what I'm going to be talking about today. But that title just doesn't really capture what I really want to come across to you guys. So this is what I would title this. <laughs> so Fantastic Beasts and How to Avoid Them. <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys have seen this movie, but I, I have this affinity with Ned. Because, you know, I, I have this love of parasites and I think they're fascinating and I think we should understand them. Um, and that's what I want to bring to you guys today. The only difference between me and what he does is that I spend a good portion of my time trying to kill them. Um, <laughs> but we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So when you're going abroad, whether that is for a trip or to work, um, there's some challenges that you need to be prepared for. And we need to kind of understand it, get ourselves in the right mind frame for what we're going to talk about today. What are the things we're worried about? One is the unknown context. So that's a picture I took in DR Congo. Okay, so it's not even, is the water safe to drink? It's where is water, okay? <laughs> so it's a whole other level that you may not be familiar with or be expecting. And you're not really sure until you get there. Um, when I went to Sierra Leone for the uh, Ebola outbreak, it was my first time in Sierra Leone. And they told me I had to take a boat from the airport to get, and somebody would pick me up on the other side. So I, I'm like, is it a, like a canoe? <laughs> is it a speedboat? What are we dealing with here? So there's a lot of unknowns whenever you're traveling and whenever you're doing, um, whether you're going on vacation or you're working abroad. You also have to keep yourself safe, right? So you want to know what you're dealing with, but you also want to anticipate things that you might not be familiar with. Okay, so worms, for example, some of these parasites. My grandfather had to deal with them, but I haven't had to deal with them in my lifetime in the US. But when I go other places, I have to think about them quite a bit. Okay, so there's things that maybe are not familiar with you that you need to be able to protect yourself from. And then you've got to keep others safe, okay? Because if you're here, if you're one of our students, um, whether, what, no matter, on day one of medical school, nursing school, pharmacy school, to all of your friends and family, you are automatically an expert in all subjects medical, okay? <laughs> For those of you who are attending the many medical school, congratulations by being here. You are now an expert in infectious disease and all your friends and family will come and ask you questions. So, it's important to, to know some of these things to keep, each, to keep others safe, so pay attention. <laughs> All right. So whether you realize that any time you step on a plane, any time you go outside, you are going into battle. Right? There are all these legions of creepy, crawly, fantastic beasts that are out there trying to get you. Right? And it sounds a little bit you know, like I'm going to have a cabin in the woods somewhere and hole up. But you have to really think about what, what's out there. So you want to know your enemy. So you need to know how can I get these diseases. We call that disease transmission. So how, how what are ways that I can get these diseases? Because if you know how you can get them, you know how to avoid them, OK? And then what are the common diseases that I'm going to face if I'm going abroad? So this is, again, going to DR Congo or Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak, or going to Mexico for vacation, OK? Sometimes it's going to Texas for vacation. <laughs> you might have to uh, come in contact with some of these things. I'm from Texas, so I can say that. Um, the other thing you want to do is you want to prepare for battle, OK? So we're going to talk about some prevention tips and what are the tools that you have in your arsenal? What are the ways that you can prepare for, um, for what you're going to encounter when you go? So just there's a lot of products that I'm going to talk about in this talk. I have no financial interest in any of them. I wish I did in some of them because I think they're fantastic. But I'm going to talk to you about the stuff that I commonly use. Um, but I don't have any vested interest in them, So just so that you all know. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways diseases are commonly transmitted, OK? So one is waterborne. So that would be things like cholera. OK, cholera lives in the water. You drink the water, you get cholera. Same with giardia, OK? There's, so we're going to talk about in a little bit. So these bacteria, parasites, um, they're in the water. And you drink the water, you get sick, OK? Vector-borne. So a vector is anything that transmits disease, uh, an animal that, or a insect or something living that transmits disease. So a mosquito, for example, with malaria. One person has malaria, the other person has, does not have malaria. You can share a glass with them, you can touch them, you can give them a hug, you're not going to get malaria, but that mosquito bites them and then it comes over and it bites you and you get malaria. Okay, so that's vector-borne. Penetration through skin. Okay, these are some nasty little buggers that go right up through your feet, okay, or that go right through your skin and get into your bloodstream and they infect you, all right? 
Body fluid contact, okay, so that's something like Ebola, all right? With Ebola, you could have Ebola, don't think you do, but, and be sitting right there, okay, and I'm not gonna get Ebola. However, if he starts projectile vomiting and I go over to try to help him, then we're gonna be in trouble because if I, get, if I come into contact with his body fluids, then I could um, get exposed to the disease. And finally, everybody's favorite, fecal oral. That is just as gross as it sounds. Okay, so that is the, the bacteria or parasite is um, transmitted in the stool, gets in the environment, somehow that stool gets into your mouth and you get infected, okay? I had a uh, mentor once that said that if, um, if feces were hot pink, the entire world would be fuchsia. So it's, uh, this is why we wash our hands because this is kind of gross and it happens more than you'd think. So what are some of the common problems? So we're gonna talk very briefly about what some of the common things that can get you sick are. So the structure of this talk, just so that you know, we're gonna talk through some of these things because I want you to know what's out there, what we're facing, okay? And then I'm gonna talk to you about some tools to prevent from uh, being a victim of one of these things, okay? Giardia, okay? Really cute, right? Look at that little guy. He's not so cute when you drink him, okay? <laughs> so this is commonly acquired, the, the traditional thing that you hear about is drinking from cold streams. So this is, you know, we all know that you don't drink stagnant water, right? Stagnant water is kind of, one, it looks gross, but two, that's where you get a lot of bacteria. But cold running streams are where you get Giardia, okay? So it's the mountain, you're on a hike, it's beautiful, there's this beautiful crystal clear water coming from the mountain and you decide to take a sip and this little guy gets you, okay? You can also get it fecal, the fecal oral route. So SNS, when, I, when you see that on the slide, that's signs and symptoms. So that's what does it look like when you have this, okay? So you get cramping in your stomach and you get this persistent foul smelling diarrhea, okay? I have had this before and it's a quick way to lose friends, right? This is not a pleasant thing to have. Um, and it's intermittent, but it's really, when you get it, it's really terrible and this will ruin your trip really quickly. The treatment's actually pretty easy. It's a medicine called tinidazole, and it's a single dose. I wish I had known this, because when I got it, we were still giving a seven-day course, and tinidazole, one of the side effects of that uh, medicine is if you have even a drop of alcohol, if you have even just a little bit of alcohol, it'll get you really sick. So it was a pretty boring week at home for me when I was taking tinidazole. Um, and then one note about Giardia, we're gonna talk about how to prevent these. So chlorine is one of the ways that we, um, we can purify our water. But one of the things with Giardia is it's pretty resistant to chlorine, so you need a higher volume. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but that's actually why the dose of chlorine that we use in water, so that's bleach. You put in two to four drops of bleach in water. Um, so it, that's per liter, thanks. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but the reason it's the dose is because Giardia um, is pretty resistant to chlorine. This guy's not so cute, okay? These are hookworms. Now, this is not a big problem in the U.S., but it is a big problem uh, in other parts of the world. These are the ones that kind of burrow into your feet, okay? So this is the killer, and, and this is why I'm not that much fun to go on trips with. Because this is the one where you have that beautiful sunset walk on the beach, right? You're holding hands with your partner, and you're walking along barefoot in the sand, and then one of these little guys crawls into your foot. You don't feel it right away. It burrows into your foot, gets into your bloodstream, goes all the way up into your lungs. You cough it up, swallow the worms, and then they get in your GI tract. It's disgusting, right? This is why I wear shoes on beaches most of the time. <laughs> Now, to be fair, so hookworms are usually transmitted in the feces of dogs, okay? So this is why if you're in a big city, you don't, in, in, um, usually in developing countries where they have dogs that are sort of running wild, you don't wanna walk barefoot on the city beach. Now, resorts usually do a pretty good job of keeping animals off of their beaches, and this is why most beaches have no dogs, um, because of this. In the U.S., our dogs are treated generally for hookworms, so it's not as big of an issue. But in other countries where there's lots of wild dogs and people aren't taking care of them, it's a bigger problem. Um, so that remote island beach, that's the best one to go to if you want to walk barefoot, okay? So signs and symptoms, there's often none, okay? So hookworms, you can have in your body and not really feel it. Sometimes you'll have a little bit of anemia because they basically latch onto the inside of your intestines and they drink your blood and they get nutrients um, th 
from the foods that you eat. Um, when they're doing that, as I talked about, when they go through your lungs and into your GI tract, sometimes you can have what looks like a pneumonia or asthma from that. Um, this is actually a bigger problem. One, it's just kind of gross. In adults, it's not that big of a problem, but in kids, they are really using those nutrients. And so when they don't get enough nutrients, they can have lower IQs, they can have difficulty in school, they can be malnourished, uh, especially in areas where they're undernourished at baseline. So this is a big problem. Treatment is also really easy. So these two drugs are anti-worm drugs, mebendazole or albendazole, and it's a one-time dose, okay? It's not gonna be pretty when you go to the bathroom afterwards, though. I'm just gonna warn you ahead of time. All right, but it's a pretty easy treatment. Don't walk barefoot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Diarrheal disease. This is the thing that you are most likely to get, okay? And we've all had this. It goes under lots of different names, Montezuma's Revenge, Traveler's Diarrhea. Um, and the one I'm talking about right now is the non-bloody kind, just the kind that, you know, you're just having a lot of diarrhea. Usually, the most common thing that causes it is what's called non-invasive E. coli, and that's the picture that is up there. Um, but there's others that can cause it as well. The signs and symptoms are pretty obvious. You have diarrhea. Um, treatment, you want to start antibiotics fairly early, but you want to make sure that you're actually having diarrhea that's associated with bacteria. Um, and so the rule of thumb is if you've had four stools in one day, four loose stools, like four diarrhea episodes, then you want to think about starting antibiotics. You don't have to. This usually is self-limiting. Um, the question is whether you're on a trip. You know, if you're uh, in the middle of DR Congo where there's not bathrooms, then it's really unpleasant to have a lot of diarrhea and it's a little hard to manage. Um, so then you want to start antibiotics to help um, the symptoms resolve. And usually the diarrhea improves within about 24 hours. Okay. Uh, and it's a three-day course. And again, this is where it's really important to make sure you take all your antibiotics. So if you're going to a place that's more remote and you talk to a travel um, physician or provider and they give you a course of antibiotics, if you start it, finish it, okay? Because you want to make sure that you're not breeding um, resistant bacteria. And then the other thing that's important is supportive care. So you want to make sure that you're hydrated. The biggest problem with diarrhea is you're losing a lot of water. Okay, so you want to make sure that you are able to keep up with what's coming out. So the rule of thumb is you drink a big eight ounce glass of water or oral rehydration solution, which I'll show you in just a minute, for every bowel movement that you have, okay, to try to stay hydrated. And then if you're having vomiting as well, you want to rehydrate with sips of water. So the, uh, the other, if you're someplace where you, it's hard to get health care, you can't get medications to help you stop vomiting, what you want to do is take a, just a sip of water, like a tablespoon of water, about every five minutes, okay? That's enough water to sort of slowly pass through your stomach without distending it or irritating it so you can slowly rehydrate. That's actually what we do in cholera camps. Um, when we have low resources and we've got kids that have cholera, it's just these quick sips. And it's hard to do because you're really thirsty by this point. Um, but it's really important that you don't over distend your stomach or trigger it to vomit again because then you have to start all over. So oral re oh sorry this is the room this is the uh, rules okay so this is one of the first rules of this talk open it peel it boil it or forget it okay that is what that should be guiding what you eat when you go to a low resource country okay the reason is if you have people that are having that are doing open defecation which means they're what it sounds like they're pooping in fields. Um, that can get on your food and that gets you that fecal oral transmission. You didn't know this was going to be this gross of a talk, right? Um, so one of the things you want to do is either open a package, so eating something that's packaged, peeling, so bananas, oranges, anything that you can take the outside cover off of are generally safe. Um, boiling kills almost everything. Um, so boiling is a good practice, so hot soups, anything that's, you know, street food, Make sure it's really hot if you're gonna if you're gonna take your life in your hands. <laughs> Be careful with that. But anything that's really hot is generally okay. Um, but if it was hot once and is no longer hot, not good anymore. Okay. And if you can't do any, if it's not one of those things, like if it the most beautiful leafy green salad from the street vendor, don't do it. Okay. You forget it. And then remember that there are a lot of different ways that people try to make money. Um, off of tourists, okay? So there is a, a product that will make a bottle of water appear sealed, okay? And with free shipping. So, so you have to be careful when, you know, when you're abroad 
Um, be careful where your bottled water comes from. A lot of bottled water in, um, in a lot of the, the low resource countries comes with a plastic piece around the top of it so that you can tell that it hasn't been resealed like this. Or a rehydration solution. So this is really easy to make. It's six level teaspoons of sugar, uh, a half level teaspoon of salt, and a liter of clean water. Clean water meaning it's boiled, okay, because you don't want to get into that waterborne transmission again, okay? So boiled water, six level teaspoons of sugar, and one level teaspoon of salt. This tastes terrible. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you up front. Um, one way that, you know, the, the problem with having more sugar than that in this is that sugar can actually stimulate, when you're having diarrhea, it can actually stimulate you to have more diarrhea. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we don't um, add more sugar to this. Sometimes mixing it with a little bit of juice just to make it a little more palatable helps. Um, it does throw the balance off a little bit, but I, it's really hard to drink this. Um, but this will rehydrate you, and this is the best solution to rehydrate somebody that's sick, okay? In most countries where this is an issue, you can actually buy little packets of this where it's already pre-made. But if you're out somewhere where you don't have it, it's a pretty easy recipe to remember. And this will save somebody's life if you need it. So another type of diarrheal disease, this is again non-bloody, but this is high volume. You need to think cholera, okay? And high volume, I'm talking... 15, 20, 30 large bowel movements a day. They call it rice water stools. Rice water stools because it's just, it's like murky water. It doesn't look like stool anymore because it's so, it's so high volume. This is a cholera treatment tent, okay? The hole in the bottom of the bed is exactly what you think it's for. There's a bucket underneath because these patients are going so much and so often that you can't keep up. Okay, and the stool from a cholera patient is highly infectious, so you have to try to keep it contained somehow. This is not something that most travelers have to worry about. So this is not generally something you're going to encounter when you are traveling abroad. Although I'm going to Tanzania on Friday, and uh, they're they've been having a cholera epidemic for about a year now, so we'll see. Um, but. <laughs> You want to be really careful of this, okay? And you need to think about it if you're having somebody. This is massive amounts of stool. This is not just I'm uncomfortable. This is a, a lot of stool, but you start to worry about cholera. One of the problems though with cholera is that it can also be very mild. So 80% of patients that have cholera don't actually show the symptoms of classic cholera. Now, those patients aren't at risk. The, the thing that kills you in cholera is the amount of um, fluid that you lose. So the patients that don't, aren't losing a lot of fluid aren't at risk. It's just another uncomfortable diarrhea, just like anything else. The problem is that they are still transmitting, okay? And so that's where we get into trouble because they just think that they have a loose stool here or there. Or it's not a big deal. Uh, and they're spreading it around, okay? Supportive care is the mainstay. That's the main thing you need to do is get, make sure these patients are hydrated. Uh, so you need to start them on fluids very quickly. ORS saves lives with cholera. Um, if they're not able to drink, you have to get them IV fluids. You have to get them to a health center very quickly because they will lose, um, you can lose your entire um, body volume of water in a day with cholera. So you have to be very, very careful and, and, and work early or uh, move quickly with these guys. If you're in an area where a cholera outbreak happens, the main thing you need to do is hand wash, okay, and bleach will kill cholera. So in our cholera tents, we have um, hand washing, you have gowns, because you don't want to be transmitting that. And we have a foot bath that's actually got water with bleach in it that you step into um, to try to keep you from tracking it outside. This is hopefully will not be as important for most of you guys, but might be important for some of you. So there's not many illnesses that are transmitted by dead bodies, despite what people think. Um, the two main ones, though, are cholera and Ebola and some of the other viral hemorrhagic fevers, okay? So in those, in a cholera outbreak, the bodies need to be treated, and you want to make sure that you avoid them, which is probably not going to be hard. <laughs> but um, be careful with dead bodies and cholera. That's important, okay? This was um, one of the areas I worked in in DR Congo. They had a yearly cholera epidemic, so the red flag means epidemic levels. The um, orange flag means alert, so it's epidemic period. Um, and this was just yearly, they just were used to it. So um, just be careful depending on where you go. Bloody diarrhea, okay? This is what we classically call dysentery, all right? 
This tends to be what we call invasive bacteria. And it makes sense, right? Because the bacteria are kind of burrowing into the intestine walls. And when they do that, it causes bleeding. And that's why you have bloody diarrhea, OK? Um, Salmonella, Shigella, Entamoeba, um, those are some of the, the types of bacteria and parasites that can cause this. Um, typhoid is uh, what you hear about. We, and for us in the US, typhoid is kind of an older disease. You hear about it in, in older books, but that's Salmonella. Um, and it's a problem in other, in other areas. So if you, depending on where you're going, uh, if you're traveling, you want to see your travel health provider because you, some places need you to, you need to take the typhoid vaccine um, to try to prevent this. One of the main things with this is, you know, you can travel with Imodium, and I do travel with Imodium for certain things, but if you have bloody diarrhea, do not take Imodium, okay? It says it on the box, but most of us miss that, okay? So if you have bloody diarrhea, please don't take Imodium, okay? The treatment really is supportive, um, so giving them fluids, uh, making sure that they're staying hydrated, um, and then most are, most or we call self-limited, or they'll get better by themselves. Sometimes you need antibiotics, so you need to see a physician to, to determine that, okay? So a little more exotic stuff, so malaria. Um, so malaria is mosquito-borne. Um, the signs and symptoms are fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and myalgias. How many people have ever had these symptoms in their life? <laughs> right? It's very hard to tell when somebody has malaria. Um, it's very nonspecific. The thing with malaria, though, is that malaria, if you grow up in an area that has malaria, my grandfather from Texas had malaria twice when he was a kid, um, and you'll see why in a few minutes, but um, it, in places where it's endemic or where, it's the, where malaria um, exists, it, the people in the area tend to have their immune systems primed to respond to malaria. It doesn't mean it doesn't kill them or they don't, they don't get very sick, but they tend to get less sick than, say, we would, okay? So imagine from an immune system standpoint, when you go to a new area, you're like a newborn baby, okay? <laughs> you're going to a new place where you haven't been exposed to any of those diseases before, and so something like malaria will really hit you hard. Um, I'm going to tell this story. It's, my friend's probably going to kill me, but a friend of my... Um, well my a friend of mine was in Tanzania with me, and he, um, I was working, and he was doing some anthropology stuff, and he texts me, and he's like, I feel like crap, I'm, you know, fever, my body aches, and I was like, you need to go get a malaria test. He's like, okay, I'll go get a malaria test. Two days later, I feel so miserable. I was like, did you get the malaria test? No, because I felt better. I'm like, well, that's what malaria does. Malaria is cyclical, okay? So you'll get a parasite, huge parasites are released from the red blood cells, which is what that picture is. Um, and when the parasites get released, you feel terrible because your immune system is trying to fight them off. And then a lot of those die. There's new ones that are still hidden in the red blood cells. So you start to feel better. And then you get another wave that's released and you feel terrible again. So this happened three times. Two times he texted me. I told him to get a malaria test. The third time he says, I'm in the clinic and I'm chock full of malaria. I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> so I went over to see him and um, I go in and he was pale, sweaty. His heart rate was 170, normals, you know, somewhere 60 to 80. His blood pressure was 70 over 50, normals 120 over 70. Okay? And I was, like, if, I was like, we have to get you better because I'm going to kill you for not going in and getting some malaria test done. He did fine. He got on medications. It was a little touch and go for about three days. So I was at his bedside for about three days. But, um, but he did OK. But do not make the same mistake, OK? The, main, the mainstay of, of dealing, of fighting malaria is prevention. There are medications you can take to prevent the infection. He had actually had all three of them. He had all three of them with him, but he couldn't decide which one he wanted to take. So he hadn't <laughs> taken any of them, OK? So, Take the medications. And then the next thing, so, um, is, so the other part of prevention is DEET, okay, and mosquito repellent, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then there's treatment with antimalarials. So these are medications that they can give you when you, um, if you were to get sick. The most important thing is if you've been in an area where malaria is a possibility, if you get a fever, it is malaria until proven otherwise, okay? This disease kills. It's very prevalent, and a lot of the locals will often, I mean, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, I feel like I have a cold, I think I have malaria again, and it's not that big of a deal. But for us, with our little wimpy U.S. immune systems that haven't been exposed to this, 
this can kill you. So please, please, if you get a fever and you've been in an area, make sure you get tested and it's malaria until proven otherwise. These are the potential malaria vectors in the United States, okay? The entire country, except for this little swath right in the middle, is at risk of getting malaria. So we actually have a couple of, every so often somebody will bring malaria back, get bitten by a mosquito, and we'll have a little local outbreak. So we do actually have malaria in the US sometimes because we have the vectors for it. The thing that we do here, though, is we have a lot of vector control. Um, and when we have an outbreak, they'll do a lot of spraying things and getting rid of pools of liquid so that um, to really try to knock out the mosquito population. But so just keep in mind that this is possible here. And uh, that's where my grandfather lived. <laughs> that was when he got malaria twice, OK? So it's not something that we are immune to. Dengue, another mosquito-borne illness. So this is a virus. The first episode is classically known as breakbone fever, OK? And the reason is because your muscles get so sore, you feel like your bones are breaking, OK? It's not dangerous, but the second time you get malaria, you can get what's called hemorrhagic symptoms, which is like Ebola, OK? So you can have bleeding. You can have bleeding into your intestines, and it can kill you. Second time you get dengue. Second time you get dengue, yeah. <laughs> what, oh, sorry, did I? <laughs> Um, yeah, so the first time you get dengue, it just, you wish you were dead. The second time, it might kill you, okay? So it's just best to avoid it. Now, the malaria mosquitoes are night biters. The dengue mosquitoes are day biters. So what do we think about that? When do you wear the DEET? All the time. All the time. That's right. So you want to be wearing DEET all the time if you're in an area that has malangue, uh, malaria and dengue. <laughs> that's going to be a terrible, that's like a horror film, right? <laughs> Um, so treatment, again, is prevention and supportive care. There's, no, there's nothing to, to specifically treat dengue. Zika. So people always want to know about Zika, okay? Zika is also mosquito-borne, and it's the same mosquito as dengue. And that's actually the mosquito, and you can, that's what it looks like. It's actually pretty easy to see those. We do have those mosquitoes here, um, but they have these little white stripes on them. Um, Zika itself, as a disease, is usually mild or asymptomatic. You may think that you have a little bit of flu, you feel a little achy, you have a little fever, um, but the disease itself generally is nothing to write home about. You could get fever, rash, joint pain, red eyes, muscle pain, headache. Again, how many of us have had those? Right? So it's, not, it's a nonspecific um, finding. But the problem is obviously what we've heard of with having pregnant women get it. And because these mosquitoes are so prevalent, if one of us has it, it's, you know, if I were to get dengue right now, because I'm not pregnant, um, if I were to get dengue right now, or Zika right now, sorry, I would maybe feel a little bit bad, but it's not gonna necessarily affect me, unless I were to get pregnant soon after, or I get bit by another one of these mosquitoes and I transmit it to my pregnant friend, okay? So that's why Zika is so scary. Treatment, again, there's no treatment for this. It's prevention, so using DEET and supportive care. So dengue and Zika, we don't have vaccines for. And malaria, we don't have vaccines for either. Malaria, you can take some medication to try to prevent it. For dengue and Zika, there's nothing that you can do to prevent it other than being really vigilant about wearing your DEET and sleeping under mosquito nets if that's appropriate. So this is the most current world map from the CDC with uh, areas with risk of Zika. It's basically every everywhere that's sort of a tropical climate, okay? And it's spreading up, and so Texas and Florida have had some cases. Uh, Florida also um, has endemic dengue, um, and they'll have intermittent outbreaks of dengue, too. So, um, you know, and, and the part of the reason for this, this mosquito is called the Aedes mosquito, and look where it's endemic in the U.S. So this has a, there's a very high risk of spread, uh, and there's this little bit right there. You see that right there? Right. So we are at risk as well, okay? So this is why it's important to wear, if you're traveling somewhere else, wear mosquito repellent so you're not bringing this back into the country because it would be very easy to spread here. Okay, Ebola and other hemorrhagic diseases. Um, so the symptoms for Ebola are also really nonspecific, and it's very difficult to tell. Um, the things you worry about are fever plus something called petechiae, and this is what petechiae are. It's like bruising, but it's little, it's little um, the, the capillaries, the small parts of your blood vessel burst, and so you get small pockets of blood, but they're very tiny, but you'll see them in specific areas. The most common place we see them in healthcare is under the blood pressure cuff. So you put a blood pressure cuff on somebody and you take it off and they've got a bunch of these petechiae, okay? 
and then overt bleeding. Although in the outbreak, we didn't see as much overt bleeding. It was more the other signs. It was a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and then towards the end, you would have some people with hemorrhagic symptoms. Again, this is not something you're commonly going to encounter when you're traveling, but Ebola is a vector-borne disease, which means that whatever started it in this last outbreak is still there, and it still could come back, okay? And the scariest, things for, scariest part of these outbreaks is that the first couple of patients we don't really know because the symptoms are just, it's fever. Things we were seeing were fever, hiccups. Hiccups was a weird thing, but we saw a lot of people with hiccups. Muscle pain, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So kind of all the usual stuff. And it was very similar to what malaria looks like. And all of these areas were malaria endemic. So it's very difficult to identify Ebola and you have to do special tests. So it's the main thing is to know about it. It's not really a threat to most people in this room, um, but to know that it exists, okay? I needed to get you through what we're fighting against so that you understand why this stuff is important, but we're gonna talk about some of the really practical things you can do to protect yourself and protect others. So we're gonna talk first about prevention. So how do we prevent from ourselves from getting sick? Your mom told you this when you were three years old, hand washing. Okay, that is one of the most effective things you can do to prevent illness, okay? Hand sanitizers and wipes are good in places where you might not have water. Um, but remember, hand sanitizer um, doesn't combat everything. So there are some things like um, Clostridium difficile, which is a bacteria that can cause diarrhea, that hand sanitizer does not kill. The other thing is if you work in places where I work and there's a lot of dust, and you put hand sanitizer on, you just made a lot of mud on your hands. So it's not great in, in, if, if you actually have stuff on your hands. That's where the wipes are actually really helpful. So if you're in a place where you don't have a lot of access to water, um, but you need to be cleaning your hands, um, the flushable wipes are good. Do not flush them, okay? My uh, uncle is a plumber and he, like I talk about flushable wipes and he just curses them because they will decompose but it takes so long that it clogs up your pipes before they decompose. And in places where the pipes aren't necessarily that strong, you don't want to flush them. The nice thing about flushable wipes though is that they're made to decompose. And so what often happens is this stuff go gets put in the trash pile in the village. And if you have something that's plastic based or that's, um, that's not going to decompose well, then you've just created more rubbish that's gonna be in that village way long after you're gone. So the, the flushable wipes are good um, to bring with you. This is just to show you the most commonly missed places on your hands when you wash. So most of us, you know, you go, you wash your hands, you do this thing, right? Like a little bit, done. Wipe your hands on your pants and go out, right? <laughs> so this is where you miss, all right? So this is really important. So for example, you know, if you find yourself in an Ebola isolation unit, this is really important. Okay, when you're traveling, this is really important. Okay, to remember that the back of your pinky finger often gets missed. Okay, so it's what happens when you drop something on your hand. Right, that's how you get that fecal oral thing. Okay, so make sure that you're catching these areas. So the backs of your fingers and then some of the creases of your palms often get missed. So when you're in a place where you're really concerned, um, and even just in your day-to-day -day life, really focus on those areas so that you make sure that you, you um, are washing thoroughly. Protection from mosquitoes. Okay, I hate mosquitoes. I love parasites. I hate mosquitoes. <laughs> I don't understand their purpose. They really bother me. They make my job difficult, right? So I spend a lot of time and effort fighting mosquitoes. So I'm going to tell you guys my tips and tricks of the trade, okay? So mosquito avoidance. This stuff, this is permethrin, okay? And again, I'm showing you the brands that mostly I use, but you know, most of these are very similar. So this Sawyer uh, permethrin is for clothing treatment. So there's a couple different ways. There's some sprays, there's dips, um, but you basically, you take your clothes and you either dip it in the permethrin or you spray it, and then you let it dry. You have to do this in a well-ventilated area. I tried to do this in Chicago in the middle of winter once and it was terrible. So somewhere outdoors when you're spraying this, um, and you don't want to touch the clothing. This, should, this is not to be used on your skin. It burns, it's not pleasant, okay? But on the clothes, you put it on the clothes and you let it dry and it goes away. It doesn't smell, there's no sign that it was there. It lasts six weeks or six washes, which is good for most of us. 
When you're putting this on, make sure that you pay attention to the openings of all your clothes. So the neckline, the sleeves, the waist, the, um, the cuffs of your pants. And also use your, put your socks, make sure you permethrin your socks because that's a very common um, area. The, the, uh, the um, malaria mosquitoes are ankle biters, okay? So make sure you get your socks. Um, and then your pajamas, okay? Don't forget your pajamas. Everybody always forgets that. You don't need to do your underwear. It needs to be the clothes that are on the outside, okay? I also permethrin a sleep sheet. So I buy one of those sleep sheets and I permethrin that because I've been in some places where bed bugs have been a problem. Um, and so when you're sleeping in the sleep sheet, anything that bites through with something that has permethrin on it, it kills it, okay? It doesn't cause it to, it's not going to um, deter the mosquitoes, but if they try to bite through it, it will kill them, okay? So it protects you in that way. It also works for bed bugs and other, they call them the no the little biting bugs that can get to you. This, of all of the DEETs, is my favorite. This is controlled release DEET. This was developed by the Army, and it is a cream. It lasts about 10 hours. You put it on in the morning, and then I usually put it on around 5 when the mosquitoes are getting bad again. Um, and that's it. It's twice a day. It's odorless. There's a bunch of different types of creams, and I have tried all of them. <laughs> Some of them are stickier than others. Anything that has actual DEET in it tends to work pretty well, but make sure that it has actual DEET, okay? Avon Skin So Soft, the idea of you know, repelling mosquitoes and making my skin softer is very appealing, but it does not work. Okay? The, most of the mosquitoes that I have lived with uh, laugh at that. Okay? <laughs> A lot of the um, sort of natural preparations also don't really work. DEET is gonna be your best friend, all right? Um, and a lot of these, so there's 100% DEET, 100% DEET uh, burns and melts plastic. The nice thing about 100% DEET is that you can dilute it. So it's easier to carry when you're traveling, but try not to put 100% DEET on your skin. These are usually anywhere from 25 to 40% DEET uh, for the long acting. And if you're gonna use a spray, you wanna use at least 40% DEET. It just lasts a little bit longer. But the sprays only last about four hours. So this is really nice because you can put it on in the morning, you can work all day and put it on again uh, in the evening. This stuff I love too, so this is not going to last as long, but this is solid DEET, which means I can take it on the plane, and about an hour before I land, I put this on my ankles, on exposed parts of my skin, on my neck, um, so that when I get off the plane, before I've had a chance to pull out my controlled release DEET, I can put this on. It's also good for kind of touch up so you're out somewhere at dinner or something and you don't have, you want to pull out the cream, you can put that on. It's, again, it's short acting, it's only lasts about four hours, but it's good for, for those kind of situations. And the mosquito net. Is that an effective way to use a mosquito net? <laughs> no, right? The mosquitoes are like, wow, she's so pretty. <laughs> okay? No. This is how you use a mosquito net, okay? The mosquito net needs to be tucked in. You wanna make sure that, and you tuck it in, make sure there's no mosquitoes inside with you when you tuck it in. Make sure there's no holes, okay? And you wanna be inside that net. Make sure that you're, don't, you're not leaning up against or touching the sides, because if it's not an insecticide-treated bed net, or if it once was but no longer has the insecticide treat, uh, treatment on it, the mosquitoes can bite through the net and if you're actually touching the net, okay? So again, what I usually do with this, is it takes a little bit of practice to tuck yourself into a mosquito net, um, but what I usually do is I'll keep it tied up during the day and when I let the net fall, I can sort of keep it bundled on the bed so the mosquitoes can't get in and then I pull it a corner at a time and drag it across the bed so I'm not lifting it up and I tuck it in. And I leave a little space, it's untucked, so where that edge is hanging out, I leave that part untucked, I'll duck myself into it and then kind of reach around and tuck underneath so that I get myself tucked in, okay? Remember, don't roll up against the mosquito net, okay? All right. Cooking, peeling food, we talked about that. Okay, make sure whatever you eat is hot or peeled. Water purification. So this comes up a lot, okay? In most places, if you're traveling, in most places, even, even more the more remote places that I go, I will buy bottled water. Um, and again, we talked about some of the pitfalls earlier. One of the things that I think is really important when you go abroad, one of the big safety issues, is making sure that you have local connections. You really, the more, local people that you know that you meet. One, the more rich your trip is because you kind of get a sense of, of what life is like in another place. But two, if you go, you know, I'll go to the, the little shop down the street 
and buy bread even if I don't need it and start up a conversation with the shopkeeper. Um, but then if I go in and I reach for the bottle of water that may be not as reputable, they usually are like, well, this one's better. You should drink this one. Um, so you really, I mean, sometimes there's some things you can't avoid. Like as you saw, that bottle cap looked very sealed. So sometimes you're going to get stuck with something like that. But the more people that you know and the more people that you ask, most of the time, tourist, uh, tourism is actually a lifeline and provides a lot of um, financial incentives and opportunities for people. And so most people, are, they don't want people to get sick or not come back uh, whenever you're traveling. So asking around and, and sort of trying to rely on some of your local uh, contacts will help. But if you're in a place where you, don't, you can't get bottled water or you don't have access to pure water, there's a couple different ways you can purify your water. So the first tenet of water purification is you absolutely have to have clear water. Any cloudy water, any water with sediment in it, that sediment, whatever you use to, to purify your water, that sediment's going to get in the way. So you need to have clear water. So if you're pulling water out of uh, a well or if you're collecting water somewhere, you need to either filter it. And you can filter it through a t-shirt, okay? Um, and then there's special cloths you can also use for that. Um, or allow it to settle and then take the water off the top, okay? You need to have clear water. The safest method is boiling, okay? Because you've got parasites, you have um, spores, which are little dormant, um, they're like little dormant time capsules that are built to not be killed by some of these methods, okay? So, but boiling will kill almost everything, okay? You have viruses um, that you're trying to fight against. So boiling will kill all of those, all right? The CDC recommends boiling for, it's like boiling for a minute or two, uh, I usually boil water for about 15 minutes because one, it's hard to tell when is it actually boiling, when does the time start, is it when you got one little stream of bubbles or when it's bubbling. I just boil it for 15 minutes because I want to make sure that I get it as hot as possible and I kill everything that I can. And then obviously cool it. That's why I drink a lot of tea when I'm abroad because I don't, it's hard for me to drink hot water by itself, but if I put tea in it, then that seems to work. Um, but make sure that you're, that the, boiling water is going to be the easiest way. You can use chemicals. So iodine and chlorine are the most common. Chlorine's easy. It's two to four drops of unscented bleach, okay, which is about 5% chlorine. Put a couple of drops in the water. Um, and it sounds really weird, but that's actually how we chlorinate water here in the US. We put chlorine in it. Okay? So it's not that different from what you're used to. It does smell a little bit more like chlorine, but the taste isn't terrible. Um, and then if it's cold, you need to add a little bit more because the chlorine doesn't work as well in cold water. Iodine, you can use five drops of tincture of iodine uh, per liter. Sorry, and the other one, two to four drops per liter. Um, the problem with iodine, iodine works really well. It turns it sometimes a little brown and it makes it taste a little funny. I don't really like it. Um, but also, pregnant women should not have iodine, okay? You should not use iodine to purify water for pregnant women because the fetus will get an ex it gets the most of the load of the iodine and it can cause problems for them later on. So if there's a possibility anybody is pregnant, use chlorine. I usually travel with chlorine tabs um, just because it's easier for me and everybody else. UV also works really well. Okay, so those steri pens that you can see, it, you find at REI, but again, UV, and I have a very simple mind, so I imagine this as, you know, you've got the bacteria hiding behind the the sediment in the water, right? So you want to make sure that there's no sediment for the bacteria to hide behind. So this is actually water purification. So you can do it without a SteriPen. You need a clear bottle and at least six hours of sunlight, of direct sunlight. So if you take a clear bottle and you put it out in direct sunlight for about six hours, that will sterilize your water, okay? So if you're really stuck, you can do that, right? But again, make sure it's filtered, okay? All right. Wear shoes. <laughs> Watch out for the little guys that crawl on your feet. Condoms. So this is something we don't talk about a lot, but you know, I didn't specifically talk about STDs, but that is a big problem. And there are a lot of places where the world's oldest profession is how people make money. Um, and you know, people are on vacation, they're having fun, and they don't think about these things. So make sure that if that's something that is applicable to you, that you bring condoms. Uh, even if it's not applicable to you, I actually always have condoms with me because I, you know, want to have them for other people if that, you know, if that becomes an issue. Um, avoidance of vectors. So we talked about mosquitoes, okay, but other things. Dogs transmit rabies. 
Um, I love dogs in the US. I carry rocks in my pockets when I go abroad because a lot of the dogs are unvaccinated, they're wild, nobody's taking care of them, and rabies is a big problem. It's also very hard to get treatment. If you haven't had the rabies vaccine, you have to be medevac because you need to get uh, immunoglobulin within three days, 72 hours, if you get bitten. And most uh, low-resource countries don't have rabies immunoglobulin. Bring food. So this is something you don't really think about, but depending on where you are, um, food shortages are a real possibility. And it may not even be that it's such a low resource area. Sometimes it can get cut off. It's rainy season, that truck couldn't get through, whatever. Um, so I always have some bars or something. Nuts are really good if you, um, if you like nuts that you can have with you that are a good protein snack. Chocolate's really good too, but it melts. Most of the places I go, chocolate doesn't last very long, so. Um, this is a restaurant that I went to in DR Congo. Um, this is the fish sitting on a tire. Um, we have what m one of my mentors, who's a water and sanitation engineer, calls a self-propelled fecal dispension unit <laughs> that is right near it. Um, and what you can't see very well, there's a couple here, there were flies swarming all over this. It was just like a cloud of flies. And I took several pictures trying to get them and they just didn't uh, come out in the, in the picture. But so we went there and we didn't have, the village we were in did, ran out of food. So we had had pretzels and I think somebody had a couple pieces of bread and so my team of like five people sort of split that up for lunch. And so we're coming back and this village had food, but we stopped and I looked at that and I'm the only non-Congolese in my team. So I looked at it and I was like, oh God, I don't want to offend anybody, but I don't think I can do it. I, I don't think there's any amount of heat that's gonna make that okay, which is not true. But in my mind, I was nervous about it. And we were looking at it, and I was like, okay, I, you know, we have to take some Pepto-Bismol and be ready for, you know, what's gonna come after I eat this. And one of my Congolese colleagues, colleagues looks at that and he goes, I'm not eating that. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go with you. But so sometimes there's not, there's not gonna be food, or that you run out of food, or you can't get to food. So have something in reserve just so that you don't get hangry with everybody, and uh, it'll buy you some time. Vaccinations, okay. I know that people talk about vaccinations. I, vaccinations, I have watched children die from every vaccine preventable disease at some point in my career. So I am a firm believer in vaccinations. Every time I go into the travel clinic, I'm like, what you got, got anything good? <laughs> Give me the good stuff. Um, vaccinations are really important. The thing that people forget to do though is you need to have them, some, some of them you need to have six weeks before you leave. So four to six weeks before you leave. So you need to think, or you need to plan ahead uh, and make sure that you, you, if you're going to some place you haven't been before. And again, places, pretty common places that people travel to, Mexico, um, Guatemala, Costa Rica. There, there are things there that you may need to have some preventive vaccinations for. Most of us have been vaccinated against polio, but we don't get a booster because we have herd immunity but you need a booster if you're gonna go someplace where polio is endemic, okay? So it's really good to see a travel health provider to make sure that you have everything that you need before you go, okay? And that you don't get exposed to some of these vaccine preventable diseases. All right, so what if someone else gets sick? What do you do? So a couple of tips. No emodium, okay, or loperamide is the, the trade name. If you have localized stomach pain, that means there's, there, it's not like my stomach's crampy and it kind of hurts when I'm having a bowel movement. This is like right here, this hurts, don't give Imodium, okay? If they're not passing gas, this is sort of an awkward question to ask somebody you're not really close to, but you need to ask it, okay? If they're not passing gas, then they could have what's called a bowel obstruction, which is where part of the bowel, the bowel's a big, you know, it's a big tube that's just kind of wadded up in your stomach, in your abdomen, and when that gets obstructed, you get, you don't have any gas that passes forward and you can get pretty distended and you can even rupture behind it, okay? So if they're not passing gas, you don't wanna give them something that's gonna slow down their bowels. If they haven't had a bowel movement recently. So again, Imodium, really good when you're having diarrhea. It's terrible if you don't need it, okay? It will stop you up for days, it's miserable, okay? So if you haven't had a bowel movement recently, you definitely don't wanna be giving Imodium. And if they're having bloody diarrhea, as we talked about. If you start antibiotics, make sure that you finish them, okay? 
And then if somebody's been in a place where, they, where malaria is endemic, make sure that they get tested for malaria. Okay, don't write it off as just a fever or a cold or I'm, you know, a little achy, maybe I'm getting the flu. If you've been in a place that has malaria, you have malaria until proven otherwise, okay? Remember to rehydrate with slow sips of water, an oral rehydration solution. And then, so this is having 48 hours of essentials with you in your carry-on, okay? Depending on, if I'm going to Congo or Sierra Leone, I have this in my carry-on, okay? But if I'm going to Switzerland, probably not this whole package, I have a smaller version of things that I need. But I certainly have another pair of underwear, I have another pair of change of clothes because um, you never know what'll happen, okay? But if you're in a place that you're not familiar with, make sure that you have 48 hours of essential things. That includes any medication, your passport, copies of your insurance, all of that stuff needs to be with you. And then, so we haven't really talked about a go bag, but this is a go bag, okay? So if I'm going to Switzerland, I don't usually need a go bag. Now, you, you never know with what's happening in the world right now, but in most places, so when I went to, I went to Tanzania and I was there during the elections, um, and we were on lockdown for about a week, and we had, there had some, it was not terrible rioting, but they had some, um, but we weren't really sure what was going to happen. Um, and so I had this bag with the things that I needed in it. So medication, I had my passport, I had money. Um, and basically it was set and it was just like this sitting on the table. So that if something happened, I could grab it and go. I knew that I had everything that I needed in here. Okay? So if you're in a place where things can be unstable, and it doesn't have to be someplace like DR Congo where you know it's probably, you know, you're probably going to run into problems. I was flying into Guatemala once when they had a, a scuffle between a couple of opposing drug lords, and it just what happened to be when our plane touched down. So having those things ready um, will really help you, and it'll help with your peace of mind as well. Learn about where you're going, okay? And this is something that I will admit that I do as well. I know when I'm going to DR Congo, I'm going to Sierra Leone, I'm going to Tanzania, I'm going to some of these places, I, I know to look it up. But I'm really bad about going to Mexico, and that's why I keep bringing it up, right? Because I lived in Texas, so we used to, you know, when I was in college, we used to sneak across the border into, into Mexico and go have drinks there. So, it, you know, this, I, I forget about the differences in um, just the flora, and it's a normal, you know, there's just other places that have different diseases, and even some places in Europe have diseases we're not familiar with here in the US. So looking at the CDC website and Yellow Book, so the CDC has this thing called Yellow Book, which is the health information for international travel. It's actually fairly readable. It's not a lot, I mean, there's some medical jargon in there, but there's, um, it's pretty easy to understand. They have sections for patients and then sections for providers. Um, but it's free and it's available online. So you can just look it up if you're gonna be traveling someplace. And then travel clinics. Um, travel clinics are a really underutilized resource. You have, there's a lot of information about what's happening, uh, it's what's up to date right now, um, and what you need, okay? And even things like anti-nausea medicine that they can prescribe you um, if you're going, making sure that you have your own medicines and that you have an, a, a large enough supply. So this is one of my favorite quotes, okay? Be prepared, chance favors the prepared mind, all right? I will tell you, I am a terrible black cloud, okay? I arrived in Tanzania, two hours later, building collapses, right? My first, first day in the emergency department in Tanzania. I uh, went in for a shift in Chicago, and the elevated tr train, there's one section where it goes underground. It went underground and caught fire. I'm not somebody you want to travel with, okay? <laughs> but being prepared and thinking through these things, one, I think my experience has sort of taught me the need to be prepared. But being prepared allows you to handle these things. And thinking through what you're gonna need, what are potential threats, what are potential risks, um, helps you to, to deal with some of these things. So some things to think about, your luggage will get lost. I, it will, okay, as soon as you think about it. My, I decided if I ever were to write an autobiography, it would be called, you haven't lived until you've had to buy used underwear in the middle of an Ebola outbreak. Because that's what I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> so my luggage got lost going to Sierra Leone. And I will tell you this, even though this is incredibly embarrassing, and you know, since we're among all of our friends and the people on the camera, uh, <laughs> I know it'll stay, it'll stay in this group. Um, <laughs> but I, I know this stuff, right? Like, this is my career, this is what I do. So I always have, I have my go bag, I have all my stuff packed, I have an extra set of clothes. 
But when I went to Sierra Leone, I flew from here and I went to the CDC training in Atlanta. And I had like, I don't know, 100 charts to do, don't tell my boss, before I got on the plane. And I, was, I had all this stuff that I needed to finish up before I was going. So I was, you know, I did this training and then I was running, 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 trying to get all the stuff done. I threw everything in my suitcase, checked it, got on the plane and tried to not panic. Um, then I got there and they're like, your luggage isn't here. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Mm -hmm. Your luggage isn't here. So I'm like, okay, this is, you know, I'm in a country with a trade embargo right now. There's nothing coming in, very little coming in, not much going out. Uh, I've got all my DEET in there and I'm in a country where if you get a fever, you have to go to an Ebola isolation unit. So getting malaria means I go to an Ebola isolation unit, right? Not what I want to do. So I'm like, okay, my, you know, I, got, I have my stick DEET because I had that with me. But, um, and so I, I ended up having to go to a market in the middle of an Ebola outbreak and it was, it was really striking because they didn't have much. A lot of the perishables, I mean, people weren't, nobody wanted to bring boats in or planes in to deliver supplies, so they were kind of cut off. But the one thing that they did have was a lot of used clothes in a place where a lot of people have died. Okay, so, um, so it was, it was um, really striking, okay? So, moral of that story. Your luggage will get lost, <laughs> carry it on, okay? Uh, I bought a bunch of clothes and I bought a big bottle of bleach and I just bleached the crap out of everything and then went from there. Uh, it was, had very interesting fashion choices for the first week that I was there. Uh, so, second thing is have a go bag, okay? I don't wanna sound, I, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theory person. I, don't, I just am really, I have really terrible luck. <laughs> so this has saved me several times. So just make sure that you have everything you need, even if it's the psychologic, thing of knowing that all of where all your stuff is and that if something happens, you can grab it and go. Make sure that you have that set up if you're going someplace where you're not sure what the environment's like. And then make sure that you have all your medications and vaccinations. You don't want to run out of a medication when you're in the middle of someplace where you can't get it or you're not sure what, you know, the, the medications have different names and different strengths and you're not sure what your equivalent medication is. That will ruin a trip really quickly. Um, and if you're there working, it, you're not gonna be able to accomplish what you need to do. So make sure that you have all of that taken care of before you go. So the question, what should I bring, okay? Um, this is actually, this is a picture I took in Congo, um, of one of the most common forms of transport. It's very dangerous, do not recommend it. Um, but so what should I bring? So I have different levels. I actually have, this is again, you know, we're amongst friends here, but I have this, um, I have a system for all of the stuff that I, I need. So I have the bottom drawer is all of my, like, I'm going to be, you know, it's like water purification tablets, flints, stuff like that, that I'm not sure what, I, what I'm going to have when I get there. Middle level is things like places that I've been before that are pretty good, but I need a couple of, you know, there's a few things that I need to bring with me. The top drawer is my, like, going to Europe, I have my, old, my passport belt or whatever it is. Um, but so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up a list of a few things. I'm going to show you what's in my, what's in my go bag. Okay, I will say there's a couple of things that are not in here because I'm going to Tanzania on Friday and so there's a few things that are packed, but I got most of it out. All right, so this is very busy, but I put this up here so that this could be distributed to you guys or you could take pictures of it. So it's set up by moderately low, extremely low resource if there's a potential for violence and then a medical kit. The medical kit is all stuff that you can buy over the counter, okay? There are prescriptions that I would recommend that you get, but those are from your travel provider. Um, and so these are all the things that you can get and just have in your, in your um, kit with you. So moderately low um, resources, so a flashlight. Power cuts happen frequently. They usually happen when you're like in the bathroom or you're someplace where you don't know um, your footing necessarily. So make sure you have a flashlight with you. Headlamp. Um, there's this scene in Anchorman, have you guys seen that movie? Where that, I forget what his name is, the guy that's not, not the brightest light bulb on the Christmas tree? Yeah, yeah, where he says, I love lamp, right? So I gave this talk to a group of, um, of, uh, of guys that are, you know, that are doing global health work and I was talking about how much I loved my headlamp and they like trolled me on Twitter <laughs> with all of these pictures of I love lamp. <laughs> so this is my headlamp, okay? I carry this with me at all times. It's great because it serves as a flashlight. Um, as a medical provider, for some of you guys, I've actually had to intubate with this lamp in Baltimore. 
randomly. Um, our intubating equipment, this is how you, you know, when you put a tube in to put somebody on a breathing machine, our light bulb broke and we couldn't find a light bulb. It was the middle of the night and so I put my headlamp on and intubated the patient. Um, so from a medical perspective, it's great. Okay, but it also is a great thing to have. It's also, if you're working or some of the hospitals I've worked in, the hospital lights go out, the patient's still in trouble. So you can put this on your head, work, and you have both your hands free. So headlamps are a great thing. Um, so mosquito repellent we talked about. All right, so in this bag, headlamp. I'll pull some of these other things out here. Um, so this is... This is my smaller version of the go bag. So in here I have this inflatable solar lamp. Okay. So this thing is awesome. And what you do is you put it, you can put it out under like the hood of uh, the dashboard of a car out on the ground. It inflates. Again, I have no financial, I wish I had come up with this stuff. And it floats. So rainy season, it floats. It actually provides quite a bit of light, and there's a couple different settings. Um, this is the alert if you need to. So I love this. Um, it's a great, it packs really small, it's very light, and it helps a lot when you're in a place where the power might go out. Because um, it always goes out right when I'm in the middle of doing something. Actually, it would go out a lot when I was Skyping with my parents when I was in Congo, and they see, the last thing they saw was me going, oh no. And then the power would go out. And so my mom was like, you've got to stop doing that to me. <laughs> um, so a phone charging bank, something that's rechargeable so that if you're in trouble, if you're out, something happens, you have juice for your phone. Um, hand sanitizer. So hand sanitizer is, we talked about the issues with mud, but it is a miracle solution because it's like napalm. So if you need to start a fire, hand sanitizer is actually a really great way to start a fire. It's mostly isopropyl alcohol. It's great stuff. Okay, so it does double duty, right? Um, hand wipes, we talked a little bit about toilet paper. Um, I don't have my little roll with me, but I buy those little, um, the dispenser, the plastic dispensers with the tubeless roll in them. Most places don't have toilet paper. I've used lots of different things, magazines, receipts, you know, <laughs> but it's always better if you have some toilet paper with you. And most public bathrooms in places that are, are lower resource settings don't have, won't have toilet paper. So it's just a kind of comfort item. My mini Leatherman, I, I'm sorry, I realized I left it in my uh, suitcase, but it's a tiny little Leatherman, and it, so it's light, but it's got scissors, it's got a knife, it's got um, a screwdriver, it's great. I've taken it with me all over the world. I've replaced it a couple times when I forgot to, left it in my uh, carry-on bag. Um, but it's great, um, and it's, it's very useful. A water, sorry? I don't. That's why I've had to replace it a couple times. <laughs> so I forget that it's in my carry-on bag and, and then it gets pulled. So those kind of things, this, if I'm bringing this, like if I'm going to a moderately low or extremely low resource setting where I'm going to be working, I generally will check a bag. Um, that's also why you need to have your 48 hours because it will get lost. Okay. Um, if I'm going someplace where I can't check a bag, that's a little harder and you have to, then you have to, you can't get something like that with you. Um, a water straw for a moderately low setting is not bad, so they have these life straws and some different things where you can actually drink from a stream. I usually have something like that with me just in case. The thing about those filters, and we, I was talking to somebody about that earlier, but the filters will get most bacteria and parasites, they do not get viruses. So if you're in an area where Hep A is endemic, um, which is a lot of, a lot of the world, um, you're at risk of getting Hep A. It's, it's okay and if you're stuck, but um, but I will carry that sometimes. A copy of your passport. So I have a color copy of my passport that I keep in my wallet, um, and I take that with me. I leave my passport somewhere secure, usually with the front desk if I'm at a hotel um, or in a uh, safe or someplace that's secure at the house if I'm staying at a, a, uh, at a house. Um, the reason for that is that there's some issues with bribes, people taking your passport, having to pay to get it back. So I usually have a copy of, with me at all times. It also helps if your passport gets stolen. It's much easier for you to get it replaced if you have a copy with you. Um, and then a copy of travel insurance. This is the most commonly forgot thing that's in somebody's luggage that gets lost and then something happens. Okay, so always have a copy of your travel insurance with you. Both the passport and travel insurance I send to my family and friends before I go too so that if I need it, they can access it, okay? And I have, now I put it on Dropbox because I can access that anywhere. 
Um, I don't know, I mean, that's, there's a whole other identity theft thing, so you might have to be careful with that. I don't know how secure that is, but for my line of work, it's, it helps. Handkerchief. This is such a weird thing. Um, it's, you know, mo very few people use handkerchiefs anymore, but it is a godsend. When you're in a place that's hot, I have um, actually buy some at REI that have their permethrin impregnated or you can impregnate it in yourself. So you can wrap it on your neck if you're getting a lot of mosquitoes. Um, it also, I feel like I'm always sweating much more than everybody else is. You get dirty. I mean, there's so many uses for it. I don't leave without it anymore. There's also a citronella wash that they sell um, at REI and other stores like that. Um, that it's a body wash, you can use it as a shampoo, you can use it as a laundry soap, and it's got citronella in it. So it's not great, it's not gonna get rid of mosquitoes for a long time, but it's short enough. You know, if I'm taking a bucket bath, the problem with the bucket bath is you're sitting there with water, you know, you're naked and there's still mosquitoes there. So you're getting eaten alive. So um, the citronella, it lasts usually long enough. It's enough of a deterrent that I can get through a quick bath um, without getting too many mosquito bites. So a sink stop and a clothesline. So I don't have my clothesline with me, but the sink stop. It's a little simple thing, but you can do laundry in a sink in a hotel room. There's lots of different uses for it. Um, you can fill up bathtubs or whatever with the sink stop, so that's been really helpful. And then a water bottle. I have a couple of collapsible water bottles that pack really easily, um, but if you're in a place where water's not easy to access, you can use that. Um, okay, so extremely low resource. So, all right, sink stop we talked about. These are chlorine tabs, so water purification tabs. Um, let's see, I also have this, this came from a, what's this, they're like those little fancy things you buy at little teen stores, they're like a emergency kit, and it's got like deodorant, and this little stain remover. Um, this is one of my favorites, so this is a silicone kettle with two little cups in it. <laughs> so I can boil water, I can, sorry guys for hitting the microphone, um, I can boil water in this if I, if I really get stuck because um, one of the hardest things about boiling water is having the thing to boil it in. Um, the other thing that I have in here is um, I have cotton balls and Vaseline. So if you're in a place where it's wet, you can um, coat the cotton balls in Vaseline. The Vaseline will light, but it keeps the cotton from getting wet. So if you need to start a fire in a place where it's wet, you can um, use that. And I, you know, you don't have to have the rosy lips version, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. You can use tampons for that too if it's, um, yeah, if you have that. So, and the same thing is you can also coat them in Vaseline. I have a D-ring just because I always feel like I have to secure something. This is a styptic pen, um, which helps to stop bleeding. Um, if you, it doesn't stop massive bleeding, but it'll stop little cuts. Uh, I have a flint. So this is a magnesium flint. This, I think, tends to light better than others. So you scrape the back of your, um, of your knife on the flint and you get a few little shards. And then this sparks that you scrape the back of the knife here to spark it. Um, this is actually, it's easier than some, but it's still pretty hard to start a fire with this. So you use this and some napalm, AKA hand sanitizer. Um, it works really well, okay? Uh, let's see what else. I have this travel can opener. One of the things that I found at places where you run out of food, there's almost always some form of canned food that you can find, but you can't usually get into it. So these little, they're flat. Um, these little can openers um, trout work really well. Then I have paracord bracelet. So the paracord bracelet, um, this is about 12 feet of high tensile strength cord. Um, so I can <coughs> tie things down if I need to. I can hang things from this. It's not really gonna <coughs> serve as an escape rope. Like it doesn't carry that much weight, but it will help you um, if you need to tie things down or tie things together. Uh, I have some camping matches, so these just to help in case my magnesium flint doesn't work. Um, portable deodorant. So I have a couple of little things in there that make me happy. And then this is a shortwave radio. Um, shortwave radios are good in, in potential conflict settings um, because, uh, let's see, how did this get turned on here? Um, because they um, oftentimes what will get the, if, Depending on what the conflict is, the, the local radio stations or the, the government radio stations may get shut down, but shortwave radio stations can still transmit. And so you'll get a lot of information over shortwave radio. 
Um, so I have a small one that I can travel with, so if I'm going someplace where there's a high likelihood of, of violence or a, a instability, I bring a shortwave radio. Um, some other things that I have here, so um, I have brought, and this is obviously the dry bag, so this will, it keeps it from getting wet, um, as, or keeps all my stuff from getting wet. Um, we talked about the paracord, mosquito net, I have a mosquito net if I'm going someplace where they're, they're not, they may not have one. Um, most places I travel that I need one, I, I can get one. Um, but if you're worried about it, you can bring that. The sleep shoot, we talked about earplugs. Cockroaches get in people's ears, and it's really gross sometimes. And anyone who's had to pull them out, um, it's really gross. So, um, and I've been in a few places where I've been in some roach motels. Um, I stayed in a, in a, um, a brothel in Ethiopia once on accident. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, you don't want to travel with me. Um, but it was, a, it was a true roach motel, and so I was really glad to have my earplugs at that point. Um, the camping matches, we talked about the silicone kettle. Uh, spork is actually, it's kind of funny, but it's a really useful thing to have if you're not sure if you're going to have utensils. And then the mosquito net fan, I will say that is my extravagance. Um, mosquito nets, uh, while they're very useful, there's not a lot of airflow under them. And depending on where you are, it can be really miserable. So in, in Sierra Leone, it was terrible. It was, you know, I mean, we're wearing like garbage bags every day at work, and then you come home and it was just stagnant air, and it's 90 degrees and 90% humidity. Um, so the mosquito net fan is about this big. It takes like 4D batteries, so it's not light. But you can hang it inside your mosquito net and it circulates air. Um, the other thing is they have some little neck fans that people can use as well, so that's a little easier option, and I had one of those with me. Um, violence, there's a leg passport holder that can go, it straps basically, I can't do this without, straps the inside of your, of your calf. Um, and so under pants, under wide leg pants, it's a little less conspicuous. Um, a cash belt, so I have a, a belt that has an inner, it's, it just looks like a regular belt, but on the inside it's got a little zipper lining where you can roll up some uh, money if you, if you feel like you need to, to, be, to hide it if it's a really unstable place. Um, the thing with cash is you want to make sure that it's distributed. So if you're going to an unstable place or some place that has the potential to become unstable, I was in Cairo, which is not that unstable right now, but I was there during the US elections and I wasn't sure how that was going to go. Um, but uh, I had a lot of cash on me, but I had it distributed in different areas. So under the lining of your shoes is one place you can put it, um, in the calf belts. Um, the one thing that will get you out of a sticky situation is having cash on hand. So um, that's one of the, the main things that, uh, that will help. The shortwave radio talked about an emergency blanket in case you have to have, um, find shelter. Personal GPS depends on the level where you think you know, how bad it's going to be. And I think most people here are not going to be traveling someplace where you need that. The other thing that's a problem with personal GPS is that um, if you're in an area where you don't get good signal, people don't know whether they need to activate, you know, if something happened to you or, um, or uh, if it's just not a good signal. So if you have a personal GPS, they can be very useful, but you need to have a backup plan so that people don't you know, you, you don't set up false alarms by being in an area without good signal. Uh, and then a waterproof backpack. I actually have a little Sea to Summit backpack that folds like this, but it's waterproof and it's really lightweight. Um, but I can, I use that depending on, so this is a nice go bag because uh, it's waterproof, but it's harder to carry because it's got just a handle. Um, so the backpack is actually good in a place where there's potential for violence and you may have to move quickly. Uh, and then the medical kit. So this is my medical kit. Okay, um, it's packed, but um, so I carry a lot of, so I have some antibiotics for traveler's diarrhea, I have Tums, I have some Ethicone in here, um, I have some more water purification tabs. These things are a godsend, these are these blister bandages. There's nothing worse than getting a blister, having it pop, and getting sand in it. Those will ruin your day real fast. So these are really nice if you're out someplace where it's hard to get care. Um, I have a Sharpie for marking if somebody gets a skin infection to be able to mark the infection to see if it's progressing. Um, okay, this is something you're probably not going to have in yours, but I have suture material in case I have to suture something. Um, Band-Aids, Benadryl, and Sudafed. So Benadryl is really important because you never know when somebody's going to have an allergic reaction and Benadryl can be life-saving. 
If you're somebody who's had anaphylaxis or a really bad allergic reaction in the past, you might want to have your um, doctor prescribe you some uh, prednisone to take with you or a steroid, uh, but that's a conversation to have with your doctor. Um, but Benadryl, you can buy over the counter and can be life-saving. Sudafed is actually really useful if somebody's going to be traveling and they get a cold. It just helps them to clear up their ears so that they um, don't get so stuffy. Uh, let's see, I have Imodium in here. I have some antibiotic ointment. I have cortisone because I hate mosquito bites and I get bitten by them all the time. Uh, if I, I, For me, I'm really good about wearing DEET, but I've had a couple of episodes where I've put DEET here and then I've done this and there's a little strip and the mosquito, I'm, they love me, so they'll find it. Um, so I have that in there. I have some very basic like tweezers and scissors. I have some topical anesthetic for burns. Um, this actually, sometimes you have the opposite problem. You do not have the diarrhea problem. You can get constipated. Uh, so I have this so that um, nobody's tempted to drink the water. Okay. Uh, and then a thermometer is really helpful because sometimes it can be hard to know when you have a fever. Um, so for malaria, it's really important. Uh, and then I have some dental. At the bottom, I have um, some dental... Uh, cement that you can buy over the counter. So if somebody breaks a tooth, you have a filling that comes out, it's a temporary fix, but it will buy you some time when you're abroad. Um, and I will have all of these things up here so you guys can come and play and look and see what's in my, uh, my kit. The other thing, you don't necessarily need this, but this is, a, it's a kitchen sink. Um, it's a sort of a collapsible bucket. Um, so for things like if you need to do bucket baths, um, if you want to collect water and then you can pull out to some of the water to boil, um, this helps with that. So, um, all right. So hopefully you guys are ready to go out into the world now and face all of these challenges head on. I wish you the best of luck in uh, your travels and in your work. And I'm happy to take any questions. You guys are welcome to come up here and look around. I can actually move this over to that table since uh, I won't be on the camera anymore. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Could you let us know what antibiotics and ophthalmic drops, things like that you might travel with? Sure. So I, um, I usually travel with uh, ciprofloxacin, which is one of the ones for traveler's diarrhea. And then I usually take um, Keflex or cephalexin, which is a good one for skin infections. Um, so I take that with me. Um, I have whatever anti-malarials I need. Um, I have actually some in my kit. I have a tiny little bottle of Napcon A, which is more for irritated eyes. And then I usually will have some sort of, uh, just like a Visine or regular eye drops, just um, in case um, you, know, you get dirt or smoke in your eyes. Um, I use uh, Ondansetron, which is an, it's a dissolvable um, anti-nausea medicine. It's great, because when I first started doing this, the only thing we had was pills or rectal suppositories, <laughs> neither one of which you want to do if you're vomiting and having diarrhea. Um, so the ondansetron's great, because you put it on your tongue, it dissolves, um, so it, that works really well. Um, I also, um, uh, I'll take prednisone if I'm, I have a couple of friends that I travel with that have anaphylaxis, so I, I take prednisone with me just in case for those guys. Um, and then scopolamine patch. Um, I get terrible seasickness. Um, and so that's a nice, I can put it on my, you know, behind my ear for, it lasts for three days. Um, the only thing with scopolamine patch you have to be careful about, scopolamine, the, the medication on the patch, if you get it in your eye, it'll dilate one of your eyes and can cause some vision problems um, just at baseline. So just be aware that that happens and you want, anytime you touch the, the pad, you want to wash your hands um, so you don't have that, have that issue happen. So, yeah. So I am not a huge fan of them. I've had, fr I'm sorry, thank you. Um, what about repellents without DEET is what he asked about. Um, I have had some friends that tried them. We've, I have tried them. Um, I, I don't think that they work. Um, and so I've really, the only thing I've had success with is DEET. Um, so, I, I mean the permethrin in the clothing, but as far as something to put on you is, is DEET. So, and that's really the only recommended thing. Yeah. When you recommend 
Uh, that's a good question. So the question was when you recommend carrying cash in different places, you, you recommend local dollars or US dollars? Depends on where you are. Um, US dollars gen tend to carry more weight, and the higher the bill, the better. So you want $100 bills generally get better exchange rates, and they go. It, now, this is a different thing. If you're tipping people, you want to have some smaller bills. Um, but if, you're war if it's for security, having a $100 bill, and it needs to be clean, it needs to be the newest version, so I think later than 2006, um, and it shouldn't have a lot of tears in it. Uh, depending on the place, like in Congo, it, if it has even the tiniest little tear, they won't accept it. Um, but So you want to make sure that it's a newer bill. Um, I also, even when I travel to places where it, you know, I'm not as worried about some of these things, um, I always have a $100 bill stashed on me somewhere. Um, and the reason is, um, in a lot of low resource settings, if somebody makes the decision to rob you, um, no matter what level and station you are in life in the U.S., if when in a lot of these countries people perceive you as powerful, wealthy, influential. Um, and so if somebody makes a decision to rob you, it's a big decision. Um, and if they try to rob you and you don't have anything on you, that often turns into frustration, which is when people get hurt. So it's not something that I offer to everybody that comes up to me, but if I sense that I'm, you know, if somebody comes up and tries to rob me and I don't have anything and I sense that things are escalating, um, $100 is enough. You know, it hurts, but it's not terrible to lose $100 as opposed to getting beat up. And it's usually enough to make that person happy so that, you know, they'll, they'll leave. Um, so I always have one of those stashed somewhere, somewhere that's not obvious. Um, local currency, usually in most places, the US dollar tends to be a little bit, tends to be more robust. So I usually have that as my backup currency, except maybe in Europe. Um, in Europe, I have euros, so. Yeah, so the question is, what about satellite phones and Pepto-Bismol tablets before you eat? Um, so satellite phones are great. There's most, there's very few places that satellite, you need a satellite phone that, that doesn't have mobile phone coverage of some sort. Now in Congo, I was there, uh, God, it was, five years ago now. But when I was there, um, um, our mobile phone coverage, wow, so you're going to get my slideshow here. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, oh, it's still going. Um, when I was there, uh, the, the cell coverage was not great, but there was always, there are three services and you just had to have three SIM cards. One of them was always working. Um, so satellite phones you need if you're really, really rural, but most places have cell phone coverage now. Um, so, and then Pepto-Bismol before you eat. Um, so there are studies that if you take Pepto-Bismol before you eat, and it's usually two tabs of the, of the tablet kind, um, before you, and it has to be every time before you eat that there is some decrease in traveler's diarrhea. Um, you have to do it literally every time before you eat, and you have to do it for a long period of time, and the efficacy is, um, it's, it's okay, it's not that great. Um, so it's better to avoid eating it. Um, I'm not gonna lie, this is totally not evidence-based, but there have been a few times where I was like, that looks really questionable, and <laughs> took some Pepto-Bismol beforehand, but that is totally, that's all superstition and voodoo on my part, because even if I had, that it helped, I hadn't been taking it long enough, and you have to, you have to continue to take it w before every meal. Um, so it's something you can do. I think it's extra medication. Um, and generally, I don't really advise that. Just be careful about what you eat. So yeah. What about acidophilus? So the question is, what about acidophilus? So that is a good question. Um, I think it's not going to prevent you from getting, um, from getting some of these traveler's diarrhea and those infections, because you, you have normal gut flora already, and that doesn't prevent you from getting it. Um, it may help you in if you're taking antibiotics and you start to clear out some of your gut flora, but it hasn't really, at least to my knowledge, been studied um, for this setting. So, as opposed yeah. To probiotics. Yeah. So the um, the comment is um, someone told her at REI that if she took out bananas out of her diet and took two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, uh, that that would make her less desirable to mosquitoes, and she found that it worked. Um, so. I don't know. I'll, I'll say that. Um, there's a lot of, of um, things people try to do to make themselves less desirable to mosquitoes. The only thing that I think we've shown from science, there was a study a couple years ago that one of the things that they're attracted to is the smell of feet. Um, so washing your feet <laughs> helps a little bit. 
Um, so that's one of the things that, that people have commented on. Um, I don't know that there's any evidence behind the apple cider vinegar. There's a lot of, of things like that, and I, I, don't, I don't really know if that helps or not. I haven't heard that one, though, so, but that's interesting. Yeah, so the question is, can you overdo with DEET? Um, I mean, anything, you can always overdo with anything, but I, um, you can always have an allergic reaction. It's very, I've never seen it, but you, anytime you're putting something on your skin, you have the potential to react to it. Um, the toxic levels of DEET are well beyond what would be, you'd be capable of doing. I mean, you have to basically eat it um, to, to overdose on it. Um, so I use, I mean, I spend half the year wearing DEET um, 24 hours a day um, and you know I haven't had any issues but the studies that they've done um, the the volume that you have to have to get to toxic levels is, is very high so the question is um, are the wristbands effective for mosquitoes and then after you apply um, DEET you know you have to wash your hands but then what happens when you don't have the DEET on your hands so the wristbands one I have not found to be very effective um, and most of you know, my colleagues that ha we have tried them have not found them to be effective. So DEET still is kind of is the reigns king. Um, and then the question about hand washing, yes, you do have to, you do want to wash your hands before you eat. Um, and it's a little bit hard. So if you're, when you're washing your hands between, I haven't found that I've had a lot of problems with mosquitoes on my hands. And I think that's mostly because I feel them. Um, but what I'll do is if I wash my hands, you know, after using the restroom or something, and I've, I've washed my hands several times that day, I'll reapply DEET. So, uh, but I do wash my hands before I eat because I have DEET tastes terrible and <laughs> gotten it in my mouth a couple times. So, I do wash my hands before I eat with that. Yes, uh, good question. So the question is, um, does DEET work if you have to lose, use a lot of um, sun lotion, sunscreen? Um, so it's not as effective, but it is effective. But the way that you want to apply it is you apply the sunscreen first and then the DEET on top of that, not the other way around. So um, it's not as effective. You might want to reapply more frequently, but it does work. So it depends on the bug. So salmonella, it's like 10 bacteria. So that's the thing that people have a hard time with with brushing their teeth. Most of the other bacteria and the parasites, is, you have to take in quite a bit of a load. but. Uh, but salmonella is the one that can sneak up on you. Um, so um, I don't generally wash, brush my teeth with tap water. What I'll do is I put a little bit of toothbrush, toothpaste on, and I have a bottled water that I use. Um, in some places, I'll just refill the bottled water with um, boiled water so that it doesn't taste that great, but it's fine for brushing my teeth with. Um, and then washing your face should be OK. Swimming, there's, there are some. Depends on the area. So there's some parasites that actually can get into your skin when you swim. There's some that can go up your nose um, if you swallow a lot of water. So you really need to kind of do some research before you go swimming in a, in a natural environment in places where you're not, where things might, you might be at higher risk. I mean, even in Hawaii with the, the recent brain infection, there's some, there's definitely, there's a couple of different amoebas and there's some other, um, there's some other uh, infections you can get from getting water up your nose, so you have to be really careful with that. Yes? You didn't mention ticks at all. Uh, yeah. Are they a non-issue? No, they are an issue. They are an issue. Permethrin helps with ticks. Um, DEET actually helps a little bit with ticks as well. Um, I also have a tick key, which is not in, maybe it's in this bag, but I have a tick key in my medical bag too. Um, most of the places that I go, you, there are ticks in those places, but they're not as I don't come into contact with them as much. You come into contact more with them if you're in contact with a lot of wild, uh, sorry, livestock. Um, so I don't come into contact with them as much, but there are definitely places. There's African tick-borne fever, um, so it is a problem as well. But the permethrin and the DEET will help. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for letting me geek out on this with you today. I appreciate it.